Plex News Time 545. Now extended traffic on the fives with Chuck Brooks. Well, so much for this quiet morning we'd hoped for this morning. A on the morning commute in Los Angeles. We have a tough drive already to start you off with. It can be difficult to imagine the sun ever setting. And a backup now starting at about Warner Avenue if you're coming up. On the internal combustion engine. But Chris Payne will tell you appetite is growing for electric cars. We're in the tipping point now. He's best known as director of a biting documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car? I wasn't really a car guy ever, but I was really into cool technology. Back in the 90s, he drove a General Motors EV1, the first mass market electric car. It held the promise of an oil-free future. But GM concluded it was losing money on the EV1 and destroyed them all. Chris Payne was incensed. I you know, imagine there's very many EV1s left that haven't been crushed out. It's pretty sad. Payne blamed car manufacturers, oil companies, and the California government for killing the electric car. I drove that car for about five years. In the process, I became kind of committed to why this technology is good and is going to roll forward in the future. This is the garage where we keep the electric cars. The roof here is uh, full of solar panels. A decade later, he's clearly a convert. The energy comes into this circuit board, and then we send it to the different chargers. Um, so you're powering off the sun? Yeah, everything is powered right off the sun here. He now owns three types of electric cars. All three of these cars don't require a charger. You can just do it off the wall. All subject of his sequel, Revenge of the Electric Car. That film chronicled GM back in the game with its gas electric Volt, Nissan with its all electric Leaf, and Silicon Valley billionaire Elon Musk unveiling the luxurious electric Tesla. Really what matters is are we making a difference in the world? You know, until we see every car on the road being electric, we will not stop. You know, this is really just the beginning of the beginning. Jump forward seven or eight years, the cars are coming back. People are like, whoa. The Model S won the car of the year. Uh, wealthy people are saying, I'm going to choose that car instead of this car. Uh, you're in the middle of a big change, fundamental change that's happening. In Canada, on the BC coast, some say change is coming fast. Zero to 100 kilometers in just a smidge over four seconds. Vincent Argiro, who made his fortune designing health software, owned the first Tesla in British Columbia. Charging port is here. He traded in his Ferrari to buy it with his wife Maggie's blessing. The idea of having a guilt-free sports car that was high performance but had zero emissions, that was very exciting to us. The car has about as much storage space in the front of the car as most cars have in the back. Wow. Um, without the giant internal combustion engine, there's lots of room. To, that's that's uh, the kind of engine I could fix, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally, when Tesla released its Model S, they got one. <laughs> oh, you pushed the button. Okay. All right. There. <laughs> nice. Okay. How much did it cost? Um, this car, as it's configured, is about 100000 Begging the question. Is this just a rich person's plaything? What would you say to that? We felt like, because we have been blessed with wealth, that we were in a position to buy this car, that it was our social responsibility to do so, to move the technology forward, to put our faith and our trust and our money where our mouth is. If you really want to get rid of petroleum products, then find a way to buy one of these cars and stop talking about it. In fact, Tesla owners can't stop talking about them. The thing took off like a rocket. It was so awesome. You can go as fast as you want. You can go as far as you want. I'm buying into a dream. Turning Tesla into stock market darling with lofty promises to put gas stations out of business. Even car reviewers are raving. This car performs better than anything we've ever tested before. Let me repeat that. Not just the best electric car, but the best car. I'm really surprised to be hearing myself say this because I'm a gasoline engine guy but you spend a little time with a powerful electric motor car and it's pretty convincing. Impressive yet 
not enough to convince this car reviewer. You can take a gas car anywhere and find fuel. If it breaks, you can find somebody who can fix it. Having an electric car is sort of like being the first gasoline car driver back in 1907. You know, it's an adventure when you go on the road. You have to, you have to plan and you call ahead and make sure that thing's still there and carry some extra, you know, sleeping bag and some food because you may be on the roadside overnight if you're not watching. It pains John O'Dell to say that. He reviews green cars for a living, like this one, an electric Fiat sold only in California. He himself owns two electric cars, but... They've got to break through, uh, in marketing terms, it's called the valley of death. You, you have a, a new technology that you're marketing. It's always gobbled up enthusiastically by the early adapters who, you know, have an eye on that. And then you have this great valley of death that you have to get through to go from the early adapter to the early majority, where sort of mom and pop starts buying. And moms and pops who only own one car still have range anxiety. Tesla may offer an impressive 370 kilometers on one charge, but the more affordable Nissan Leaf, only 120 kilometers. The fear of running out of juice is real, because charge stations are still few and far between. Plus, at a park and plug like this, it takes four hours to fully charge. So you don't buy the claim that, that uh, gas gonna stations be... are going to be a thing of the past and we're going to see plug-ins uh, on every corner? No. No, I don't. I, I think the gasoline engine is going to be going to be here in, in large numbers 25, 30, 40 years from now, unless, you know, we simply run out of gas for either geo, for geopolitical or economic reasons. Chris Payne likes to say fear of change disappears once someone test drives an electric car. Once people do it, they become like holy warriors. But he knows North American buyers aren't stampeding to electric car showrooms. Fewer than 3,000 EVs and plug-ins were sold in Canada last year, less than 0.2% of auto sales. In the U.S., about 50,000 electric and plug-in hybrids were sold last year, a mere 0.6% of auto sales. Why? Oil still rules. Just five minutes from Payne's home, the largest urban oil field in the U.S., newly invigorated thanks to fracking. I wanted to bring you up here because it really does suck. They're sucking up fossil fuels from the center of Los Angeles when we have all the power we need coming down from the sun on millions of roofs that could be powering all the electric cars here, whether it's tar sands or going back to these old oil fields and fracking from them in the middle of a very populated area. It's old time thinking and it's not thinking what we can be doing. What were you driving before? I was driving Prius. A Prius? Yes. And you like this one better? It's for green. It's good yeah. for the earth, good. right? And you don't smell gas. Enter Paul Scott, the top salesman of Nissan Leafs in California. I love talking to my customers and, and Leaf drivers in general because they all understand it the way I understand it. He's a lifelong environmental activist who fought long for electric cars, then signed up to sell Leafs for Nissan. You could be retired right now. Why the heck are you selling cars? You know, it's important because um, tra transitioning from internal combustion to electric solves a lot of the world's worst problems. We fight wars over oil. We've never fought war over electricity, and we never will. You can make uh, electricity from the sunlight falling on your house, from the wind blowing through the mountain passes, and you can run your home and your car on that renewable energy. That eliminates all the pollution from extracting, shipping, refining, distributing, and burning of oil. Going back and forth, no yeah. problem. I, yeah. I don't even have a quick charge at home. Yeah. I just plug it into the wall, yeah. and it works. But dad's in the hospital, I need to make a detour, ah. now I'm in trouble. Well, that's why we have so. the fast charger. Yeah, no, this is great. For every consumer concern, Scott has an answer. What am I going to have to do when I have to replace the battery? But eight or ten years from now, I'm going to have to put $12,000, $8,000 into no, no, no. a new battery. It's probably more like five or $6,000. And you've just driven the car for eight or ten years and haven't spent a dime for gas. A lot of them are just looking at the bottom line, Paul, yeah. right? They're, they're, they're sitting down, they're, they're punching their calculators, and they're saying, you know, I don't know if I can make the car payments right now at, on a $34,000 car. It's really a matter of understanding math. 
and, and looking at the long term rather than just today, what is it going to cost me today? Because, you know, the, these people who buy these cars or lease these cars, they stop going to gas stations. But he admits it's a long, slow sell without government intervention a la Norway. Norway has more electric vehicle owners per capita than any country in the world. Sales jumped after the government declared EVs exempt from taxes, parking fees and tolls and installed thousands of free public charging stations. But different story in the U.S. The Obama administration did ask a panel of thinkers to fast forward 35 years to try to figure out how to cut gas emissions from cars by 80 percent by 2050. So you start with all your new technologies. John O'Dell was part of that panel and wasn't convinced electric is the only answer. Short of insert miracle here, uh, we're going to have a mix of highly efficient gasoline cars, highly efficient conventional hybrid, you know, gas electric hybrids, plug-in hybrids, some electrics and some fuel cell hydrogen vehicles. So some so battery electric. Not, no one technology no is going to win. No, by 2050, no one technology. We just don't see it. Ha Our committee did not see it happening. Tesla will have you believe this is the miracle. The Tesla supercharger. We expect to cover the entire United States and the lower part of Canada. The supercharger highway, where Vincent and Maggie Argiro charge up in no time flat. We need to be here for maybe a half an hour just to leave a little cushion to get home. And it's free. It is free. Enough time to make new friends, perhaps discuss that $35,000 model Tesla promises for 2017. Then, off we go. Have a safe drive. Don't go too fast. Oh, we won't. Even though we can. <laughs> we, we will. Yeah, we'll keep the horse in brains. <laughs> Bye. As for Chris Payne, he's on to a new documentary about the rise of bicycle culture. I still think there's tremendous forces trying to shut down electric cars. And the good news is that there's a lot of forces trying to make them happen. Will the electric car ever cross its valley of death? It won't happen overnight. Not without convincing consumers it's time to switch. Duncan McHugh, CBC News, Los Angeles. We are in a race. The race is against time. We have to build cities. We need them, but we have to make them in a different way. We need a wave of innovation, not only for our way of life, but also for the planet. The consequences would be enormous if we lose this battle. has right now close to a billion cars and we might double the number of cars on the planet by 2050. We're going to need transportation fuels for those. This has kicked off people looking at a whole range of other alternatives to petroleum in your tank. Sugarcane to ethanol is an incredibly efficient process. You get out about seven times the energy you put into growing the sugarcane. Imagine that you could have one process that could take in sunlight and carbon dioxide and turn it into fuel. And imagine if that didn't involve growing anything at all. The cost of traffic is people's time. It's obviously money. It's fuel wasted. It's an emotional toll. It's a frustration. If there's technology that would allow me to spend less time in the car and spend more time at home, I'd be all for that. 
you took a satellite picture of the highway, you can see that there's actually a lot of open space. Maps in the future are going to be able to help people get places either more safely or more efficiently. The vehicles will be intelligent. We will see completely autonomous driven vehicles. Suddenly, mobility becomes a whole other thing. The way we've been building cities lately is unsustainable. We can't go on building them that way. Well, welcome to Mazda City. It's the world's first carbon neutral city. We are driving in the, in the bowels of Mazda City in an electric transportation system. It's slightly unnerving to see this for the first time. Where are we going? The whole scale here is based on the human being. It's not based on the motor car. One thing that's very encouraging about Mazda is it does represent a whole different value system. We're trying to do as much as possible with as little as possible. The payoff is how can everything it's trying to do matter in the rest of the world? Research needs to be done now and by as many people as possible. We have a long way to go, but I'm confident that we'll get there. Thank you.